Welcome to you all, and it's a great pleasure to be back speaking at the Theosophical Society in England after the Annie Besant Conference of October 2017, which I was one of the organizers of. And um, interestingly enough, out of that uh, conference came an invitation for me to um, co-author an article for the British Journal of the History of Philosophy about Annie Besant. They're doing a special issue on 19th century women philosophers. And um, the research that I have been doing on that project is the basis for what I'm talking about with you today. So welcome to uh, Theosophical Ethics and the Science of Peace. And I want especially to thank Damon for inviting me to talk on this subject because I hadn't really thought of it as a possible presentation to a theosophical audience. It was primarily being geared in the beginning for more of an academic audience. But he thought that uh, ethics is very much needed these days, which I agree with, and that if there is a theosophical ethics, that somehow is relevant not only to the world at large, but also to helps us become more apparent in the world. So the idea then of this theosophical ethics, as Annie Besant taught it, is that we change the world through experiencing unity consciousness. So I want to start with a working definition of ethics. This is my own, which is based on personal observation and a lot of deep consideration as opposed to drawing it from academic books. But it's framed in an academic way because I want to use it as a basis for the article that I'm working on. Ethics is an established and or evolving set of principles for guiding choice making. For the greater good of all, and according to some definition of greater good, made normative within some self or group defined all. So um, I'll be elaborating on this as our talk progresses, but I want to highlight the greater good and I want to highlight the all. And those are specifically, I think, things that we theosophists stand for. So continuing this working definition, the greater good may involve any of the following aspects of personal health, well-being, and happiness slash fulfillment in any degree and combination. Before I go on to the, the list, I just want to highlight that the idea of the greater good has to do with our quest for health, well-being, happiness, and fulfillment. And Annie Besant would add bliss as well, spiritual bliss. So obviously physical health, well-being, emotional health and well-being, mental. Socioeconomic, which is of course something that's critical to all aspects of who we are, even though uh, it's often an uncomfortable bedfellow, so to speak, with the spiritual and religious aspects of ourselves. So again, the idea of greater good involves in any ethical system one or more of these or some combination of these. And then continuing the working definition, the all may involve any degree of conscious or unconscious inclusivity or exclusivity. Now I um, created the list based on American politics because I figured no one here would be offended, but also because you're all very familiar with what's going on there. Uh, is there something I need to do to click on the X? Okay, there we go. All right, uh, consciously inclusive might be something like U.S. residents. Con consciously exclusive would be U.S. citizens. So now we've eliminated all the immigrants. Unconsciously inclusive would be you, uh, Americans. And I say unconsciously inclusive because that leaves out religious distinctions or regional distinctions that may have something to do with a person's political beliefs or their definition of ethics. 
And then finally, unconsciously exclusive, which our president has uh, done several times, which is Puerto Ricans, who are actually American citizens, but somehow our president tends to forget that and think of them as immigrants, which is a crime, in my opinion. Okay, now, the reason why I'm putting this up here is because everybody has ethics, but we love to accuse people of not being ethical. And the problem is, within their own system, they consider themselves ethical. So if we're going to talk about ethics in any way that is uh, helpful, I would say, we have to understand that we want to lift people up to a higher vision of ethics instead of accusing them of being unethical. So that's the starting point for what I'm saying. <clears throat> All right. If we're considering some ethical system, <clears throat> we need to be able to assess it. And that's the primary reason why I came up with what I was sharing with you, my definition of ethics. So here are the questions. How comprehensive is an ethical system's vision of the greater good? In other words, how much of that list that I gave you does it include? And then continuing, how consciously inclusive is its all? And this is the determination of whether it's an ethical system that enhances selfishness and separation, or an ethical system that enhances unselfishness and unifying, which is what the Theosophical Society stands for. And then, in addition to that theoretical assessment, there's also a practical assessment. To what degree does the guidance offered by an ethical system allow us to instantiate its goals? In other words, can we actually take the theory of it and live it? There are many beautifully rounded out ethical systems. For example, Hegel was known for his ethical system. <coughs> Excuse me. That is so highfalutin, so to speak, that it's very difficult to know exactly how to apply it in any given situation. So, to what degree does its guidance allow us to realize health, well-being, and happiness, and fulfillment? And then, most important, to what degree does its application cause the least injury or harm to any? Now, I don't think, uh, except for some of the uh, 19th century philosophers of the utilitarian movement, which I'll be talking about in a moment, that Annie Besant was familiar with, I don't think we tend to think too much about the idea of injury or harm. And um, what I mean by that is, as a general public, I don't mean ethicists per se. The problem, of course, then, is we have a kind of ethics coming out of our governments now, which has a far right um, tendency. And the problem is that it excludes a lot of people and causes intentional or unintentional harm to them. So my idea is that if we're going to develop an ethical system, and if we're going to be able to rate ethical systems, the key thing is how much harm or how little harm does it do in the long run. And this is an expression of what I mentioned earlier, the greater good of all. So. To Annie Besant, people think of her primarily as an activist, an author, an editor, and one of the great orators of her day. Uh, she's often called one of the greatest female orators, but of course that was in order to keep the prerogative open for male or orators to be better. But I think many people considered her to be literally one of the greatest orators. And this picture is from about 1904, 05, um, I believe, and it represents the Annie Besant that was generating the ideas I'll be talking about. Now, I put philosopher with a question mark after it because in all of my study of Annie Besant, I have only found one place where anybody ever called her a philosopher while she was alive. And it was somebody in Boston who was so excited about her coming in 1891 that she was trying to introduce everybody to the idea that this was a great female philosopher. 
And this, in a way, is the first question I have to answer for my talk, or sorry, my paper, on um, the, for the British History Journal of Philosophy. So why was she not considered a philosopher? Why was she not called one? This is something that I'll be dealing with in the next few slides. What I've learned is that pretty much all of her adult life, she was struggling with one of the major philosophical questions. Can ethics exist without metaphysics? So we know this question in, in an indirect way because we all would love for some kind of ethics to be taught in schools, but for the most part, it's not. And one of the reasons is because it's very difficult to come up with a purely philosophical or humanistic approach to ethics. And the idea is to keep education secular. So at least in America, most people, who, if they get any form of ethical education, it'll be in their religious upbringing, which was certainly the case for me. So um, one of the things I've uncovered in the process of doing my research for this uh, paper is Annie Besant's moral evolution. And we all know that she went through a number of stages, and generally, uh, during her lifetime and afterwards, people would talk about these stages as conversions. They did not see them as continuous because they didn't see her as a philosopher. But if you see her as a philosopher, you can see that for about 40 years, she was absolutely one-pointedly focused on this idea of ethics. So she started as a good Anglican Christian, and she was dealing with a form of ethics that came out of Revelation, which is pretty much the way the Bible was taught in most 19th century places of worship and religious orientations. But in 1873, she began to doubt. This was the period when she was starting to question the validity of the church, especially considering her husband, who was a wife abuser and also supposedly a good Christian gentleman. And so this eventually caused her to leave the church. She went through a very, very brief phase where she was looking into an alternative to Revelation. This was called inspiration, and it was taught by the people who considered themselves theists, which means they believed in a god, but they didn't believe in an established church. And the idea behind inspiration was that each of us had a conscience you know, that good angel who would whisper in our ears about what it was appropriate to do or not to do, or some more direct connection to God that might come, for example, for a Quaker through a, an inner listening or a, or a sensing of the inner light. So um, during her period of questioning, even before she left the church, she was already experimenting with this idea of inspiration. Uh, the majority of her time before she became a theosophist was involved with a, an ethical doctrine called utility after 1874. And uh, this was very much a part of her more atheist and secularist uh, political and religious uh, activism until 1890, which was when she dropped her membership in the National Secular Society because of her being an an active theosophist. It also uh, developed a particularly socialist focus in the latter 1880s. I'll be talking in more detail in a moment about what exactly this doctrine of utility means. It, it has nothing whatsoever to do with any kind of God. It has to do with humanity and the needs of humanity. And the idea of utility is whatever works to create the greatest amount of happiness for the largest number of people. She then decided, after she became a theosophist, that the best way to look at the idea of morals and ethics was from an evolutionary perspective. And of course, as everyone was during her lifetime, she was struggling with the idea of uh, scientific materialism and Darwin as being the basis of evolution. But it was also true during that period that evolution was considered not just to be a physical body phenomenon, but also a social phenomenon. And, of course, with the advent of theosophy as well, 
a spiritual phenomenon. And the interesting thing about theosophy is that it combined not only the physical aspect of evolution, but also the socially progressive aspect in the idea of the evolution of the various races, um, where race means more eon as opposed to skin color, and spiritual evolution in an ever-rising spiral of getting closer to oneness with the all. And then she went through a phase which hasn't really gotten the proper attention, and that is a mystical phase that began after her first visit to India in 1893, where it was said she converted to Hinduism. And this was made uh, a topic of newspaper uh, diatribes and also raillery uh, during that period. It was said that she was wearing her saris and robes and eating vegetarian because she'd, quote, gone Hindu, unquote. What's true about this, though, is that she became more or less a convert to the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita, which I'll also be talking about in a moment. And it was within the context of her exposure to Hinduism that she really developed the idea of ethics that I'll be talking about today. So we'll be starting with just a brief account from 1874 in a pamphlet called The True Basis of Morality of what she thought ethics was. And then we'll do uh, 40 years later when she'd gone through this entire process. As far as revelation is concerned, that was the Christian Bible, that was priestly authority. Intuition was conscience, custom, tradition. The problem with the Bible was it was unreliable, it was not historically provable, it was possibly by a number of different people and not necessarily the revelation <coughs> of some divine consciousness. And the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, as far as she was concerned, was grotesque because there were so many purely immoral things going on in the Old Testament that were not present in the New. And then with respect to intuition, the problem was if we had a conscience, it was primarily made up of how we were brought up. It was our custom, it was our tradition, and if you looked at other cultures, you discovered that they had different intuitions and different forms of conscience. Therefore, because it was relative, you couldn't really base morality on it in any solid way. So now we have utility, as I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, Annie Besant's great political colleague, Charles Bradlow, defined it as the greatest happiness for the greatest number without injury to any, which I think is uh, quite an improvement over simply the greatest happiness for the greatest number, which is the way that it was being taught by John Stuart Mill and several individuals um, earlier, um, Bentham, for example. And then later, she used the Marxist phrase that we're all familiar with, from each according to his capacity to each according to his need. So then, uh, fast forward, so to speak, to 1915, she rewrote that pamphlet and called it the basis of morality instead of the true basis of morality. And she defined the five stages that I talked about earlier, and she added a little bit to her comments on the earlier ones. So her remarks about revelation had to do with that it was inconsistent, but it was possible to look at the world scriptures and choose the parts of them that really spoke to you as a way of supporting some higher ethics. And so um, there was a point where she did a pair of books called The Universal Textbook of Religion and Morals. And those are excerpts from uh, six or seven of the world's religions that are based on um, theosophical principles but could be looked upon as a basis for ethics, doing exactly what she recommended here. Intuition, as far as she was concerned, was faulty, but not a bad way to start. And for now, it includes past life knowledge, which was an idea that she didn't have access to when she was only talking about custom and tradition back in 1874. Utility was workable, but the problem was it often excludes minorities, minorities, 
and the notion of what the greatest happiness is, is subject to debate. Evolution, however, she thought of as being completely workable when it includes the ideas of physical, social, and spiritual evolution, but especially mysticism. This, according to Annie Besant, provides validation through direct experience of buddhi, unity consciousness. You can have that personal experience, you can base your ethics on it, but you can't use that experience to control the behavior of others, because otherwise you end up with a tyranny. So it's very important to understand in the battles of ethics that we see going on around the world, and especially in the news, that we understand that that people are wanting to impose their ethics on other people. You claim that someone else's ethics are inferior to your own, and therefore, instead of lifting them up, you simply denounce them, push them down, and try to silence them. Instead, if everybody was, in a sense, self-illuminated by the idea of unity consciousness, what would happen is we would all have the same ethics. Again, this will come out as I'll talk about it later. And anybody who's operating from this principle of unity consciousness can gently point to people, point out to people that there are more expansive, more comprehensive groups that we can be thinking about. We can be more consciously inclusive. So the thing is self-transformation. Transform yourself according to unity consciousness and let that spread out throughout the world, instead of trying to develop an ethical system and imposing it on people. So what is buddhi? This is Annie Besson's definition from 1895. The faculty above the ratiocinating mind, or manas, which she also called the pure, compassionate reason. She sometimes called it the pure reason, sometimes the compassionate reason, sometimes both exercising the discriminative faculty of intuition, of spiritual discernment. So now she's bringing intuition back, but it's a higher intuition than most people have access to. And it's the faculty which recognizes and realizes the unity of the self. So if we're working on developing this idea of buddhi within ourselves, and we're able to touch some idea or some experience of unity consciousness, then we will become more ethical people. So the first came from the Bhagavad Gita translation that she did, published in 1895. And the second one came from a book I'll be talking about in more detail in a moment, her advanced textbook of Sanatana Dharma. Um, you'll have to look at the slide for the spelling. So a um, little bit about Annie Besant in India. This photograph was actually taken in 1897 when she was in New York, but you can see she's dressed in a sari. So here she is as her Indian mystical self. As you probably know, she joined the TS in 1889. A few years later, she took her first tour of India, where she was lecturing throughout the country for many, many months. She founded Central Hindu College called CHC in 1898. This was a place for Hindus to go to get uh, religious training in addition to college training. And her idea was that in order to renew Hindu culture, both parts were equally important. 1907, she became second international president of the Theosophical Society. She was pushed out of Central Hindu College in 1913. This was uh, in part a result of her promoting Krishnamurti as the world teacher. This was not seen as being um, exactly in, in alignment with Hindu teachings, even though there was a claim that the world teacher was related to the Kalki Avatara, which is the coming avatar of, of Vishnu. Um, and it was creating a lot of conflict on the campus. It was inappropriately spiritual in a non-religious way, according to conservative Hindus. So she was pushed out, and that was the year that she also began her political work in India. And she worked 
throughout this early period with Central Hindu College with this gentleman, Bhagavan Das, who lived quite a number of years beyond her, uh, was in 90-ish when he died. This is one of the rare photographs that I've been able to find of Bhagavan Das. He uh, got his BA and at Queens College, Benares, 18, in 1885. He got an MA in philosophy and joined the TS. Now, if you do the math, 1883, he did four years, so let's put him into college in 1880. He was only 10 or 12 years old, so he was a bit of a prodigy. And he got his master's in philosophy before he was 20. He met Annie Besson in 1894 when she was on tour. He was also involved in the founding of Central Hindu College. There was a rift with Besant. He actually denounced her because of the uh, Krishnamurti um, ideas, the world teacher ideas. And they remained in a collegial way throughout the rest of uh, their shared life together, um, somewhat close, but they didn't work together as collaborators after 1913. And he was directly, Das was directly involved in the final conversion of Central Hindu College to Benares Hindu University. I mention this date, 1916, because the pamphlet that I shared earlier, The Basis of Morality, was published in 1915. That represents more or less the end of her collaboration with Bhagavan Das in a variety of ways, not just because um, the two of them had had a rift, but because she felt that she'd come to the end of her moral and ethical evolution with this question of ethics and metaphysics. So this brings me to something that I'm calling the Sanatana Dharma project. So that word Sanatana Dharma is Sanskrit for the eternal religion. And it was used a little bit before uh, Besant's time. There were some um, nationalist movements that were trying to put religion back at the center of um, Hindu thought and politics. And Besant picked up on that and carried it forward, and it continues to be a hotly debated nationalist topic now. Besson's version of it was somewhat different. But I call it the project because this was a collaboration between Besson and Das, where they worked closely together for a period of about uh, 15 years. It began with a Sanatana Dharma Catechism of 1902, which was a set of 40 questions that you could teach to Hindu youngsters to help them understand the basis of their religion. And Besant and Das put a circular around to find out um, what everybody from different Hindu sects could agree on as the essentials of Hinduism. They didn't want to include anything that would cause a fight. And so they were trying to universalize this um, Sanatana Dharma project and bring forward the idea that the sects all develop from some original version, and that if you go back to the original version, you'll have the real religion. And the eternal religion is the ageless wisdom, as taught in theosophy. Then she created uh, an elementary textbook, also called Sanatana Dharma, uh, specifying that it was about Hindu rel religion and ethics, and as you can see, this went through a number of editions, the first in 1902, another one in 1939, and then the most recent one in 2002. Now, this is an extremely important book. She, she herself wrote it, although Bhagavan Das was kind of a consultant for it. It's eloquent, it's passionate, it's deeply wise, and even if you're not particularly interested in Hindu religion, the ethics part is fascinating. And I highly recommend investigating it. It is still currently in print. The idea of the elementary textbook was, how can we teach people up to high school level about ethics? And this particular uh, version of the textbook is full of stories from the Hindu epics about what it was like for the great heroes and heroines of Hindu literature to confront ethical problems and come up with appropriate solutions. Now, 
The other thing that's important to understand about this is the book was published anonymously in 1902. In 1939, Bhagavan Das uh, provided some information that goes into a historical introduction and says that Annie Besant wrote it. But her name doesn't appear on this book until the edition of 2002. So as far as academics who study theosophy or, or the history of, of um, Hinduism in relationship to the Theosophical Society, this book has been completely invisible. And then there was a sequel, Sanatana Dharma, an advanced textbook of Hindu religion and ethics. That was published in the following year, 1903, again anonymously, again released in 1940 with a little bit of an indication it was by Besant, and then finally re-released in the year 2000 with her name on it. Again, wonderful, especially the part about ethics. I highly recommend it. It doesn't have so many stories, um, but this was intended for college students, so it has some of the philosophy behind it. And if you know uh, your theosophical bases, you'll see just how beautifully she managed to integrate the ideas of Hinduism with the ideas that were taught by Blavatsky about ethics. <coughs> And then she followed this up with her last installment with the book I mentioned earlier, The Universal Textbook of Religion and Morals in two volumes. Um, that's a very worthwhile text to explore too, but it looks rather dry unless you realize that it was her attempt to take this Sanatana Dharma and bring it forward out of Hinduism into the religions that came later and show that there's a, a direct connection with the basic principles of all religions. And then, in parallel to this, Bhagavan Das was working on his own version of this Sanatana Dharma project. This started with a book called The Science of the Emotions, published in 1900 and then again in 1908 and 1924. Um, Bhagavan Das was a philosopher, and when he thought of something new, he just added it. He didn't rewrite the books, and so what you've got are books that expand like accordion files. And they actually, by the time he gets to his final edition, they're not very readable. So if you are interested in looking into this, you may be able to find the science of the emotions in either of the two earlier versions, and you might want to look into it. However, everything that's in that is explained by Annie Besant in a much more coherent way, i.e. non-philosophical, in the Sanatana Dharma textbooks. He also wrote a book called The Science of Peace, again, several editions, 1904, 1921, 1948. This is a very challenging book. You have to know a lot about Advaita Vedanta. You also have to know something about Western philosophy. There was a, a reigning neo-Hegelianism during that period. Uh, Hegel from the um, early 19th century, late 17th century, was uh, 18th century, was a great philosopher of ethics, and England was completely smitten by him during this period, and everybody was dealing with a kind of abstraction that made it very, very difficult to think about the ordinary day-to-day -day life as having any real relevance. And the thing about ethics is it's very much about what we do in our daily life. So you'll find philosophers struggling during that period with these high concepts of the all or the absolute or something like this. But when they get down to um, pragmatic experience, they're not interested in it. They can't do anything with it logically. There's no connection as far as they can see between the empiricist or materialistic views and their own lofty monism, as it was called at the time. And what Bhagavan Das did, which I think is, is brilliant, is he took Advaita Vedanta and showed how step by step it comes down till you get to our daily moment by moment decision making. And it's all based on the idea of likes and dislikes, which is something that we'll find in contemporary psychology, but it comes decades later. <clears throat> He also wrote a book called The Science of Social Organization, again through many volumes and editions. This one I 
do not recommend. Um, his idea was to take the laws of Manu, an ancient text that was guiding all of Hindu ethics, and try to turn it into a program for re reforming society. And I think it has uh, historic importance and should be studied by scholars, but I don't think it has much use for most people. Um, trying to sell the idea of the caste system as being a, a valid basis for rebuilding society is not a particularly easy thing to do, even during his time, and certainly much less so now. So in the science of peace, I'll be going very briefly through some of the key points so that you'll understand that connection I was talking about between metaphysics and ethics. You've got the self, Atman, one, oneness. You've got the not-self, an Atman, the many separated selves. If you call the many a class, they're the not-self, not-self. But if you look at them as individuals, they are the separated selves, Jiv Atman. I won't be using these ter terms much beyond this slide. It's just, if some of you have been studying Advaita Vedanta, this will show you a connection. Then in, you have a relationship between the self and the not-self. So if you posit the self, and then you see the not-self, which is the part of the self that is somehow uh, creating individual selves, then there's a relationship between them, and that is the world process or samsara. This results in what's called the path of outgoing and the path of return. The path of outgoing, pravriti merga, is what we call involution in theosophy, and this is what actually forms the separate selves as they're cast out, so to speak, from the one self. Then the path of return, vrite merga, is evolution, which we know far more about from the theosophical standpoint. And this is the reunification of the separate selves into the one self. So here's what Annie Besant had to say about this path of outgoing versus return. And you can see, by the way she describes this, how she links these broad cosmic movements with our everyday lives. So the first is the path of outgoing, the second is the path of return. In the first, the man evolves by taking, in the second, by giving. In the first, he incurs debts, in the second, he pays them. In the first, he acquires, in the second, he renounces. In the first, he lives for the profit of the smaller self, in the second, for the service of the one self. In the first, he claims rights. In the second, he discharges duties. And that comes from the basis of morality, which is another highly recommended text. So you can see the essential morality of the distinctions that she's making here. And she's also claiming, in the Sanatana Dharma textbook in particular, that if you're on this path of outgoing, you have a different set of ethics guiding you than if you do on the path of return. And most theosophists, she would assume, are so because they are on this path of return. So continuing with the science of peace, we've got a distinction between rega, or attraction, which unifies, and devesha, or repulsion, which divides. I mentioned that basic psychological distinction it's fundamental to the idea behind Advaita Vedanta. And the idea is we want to not follow attraction and repulsion. We want to internalize so that we're not reacting to everything that's going on outside of us. That's the way to create inner peace. So if you think of Raga and Devesha as likes and dislikes, they help to build individuality. If you think of them as seeking pleasure versus avoiding pain, they tend to create bondage in the separate self. And if you think of them as increasing affection versus decreasing aversion, they build unity. So what I'm trying to build here is an awareness that likes and dislikes can actually be useful if we pay attention to them. Most of us just react. We don't have any idea that this could be a pathway.
for developing <coughs> ourselves spiritually. So finalizing this idea from, from the science of peace, what we need to do is convert the avoidance of pain to sacrifice or selfless service. And in doing so, we gradually eliminate our bondage in the separate self. And what happens then is spiritual bliss replaces the pursuit of selfish pleasure, increasing with each stage of union with the one self. So essentially, we let go of the idea of pursuing happiness. And instead, we open up to the idea of allowing bliss. So there's a difference between pursuing because you go outside of yourself. Allowing is opening up to that experience. And we do that by selfless service. The result of moving in this direction is inner peace. And if we create that inner peace in ourselves, it tends to spread to others. And the result is outer peace begins to ripple out from us. And this is how we change the world. So this brings us now to theosophical ethics. And I want to say here that what I'm going to present is not any Besson's system. It's a kind of updating of it to make it relevant to our time. But it uses many of the words that I've found in the books by Besson and Das that I've been researching. So we train the bodies through self-restraint. This runs through almost all of Annie Besant's writings. You'll find it, for example, in a book called The Higher Life, which was written about this same time. We practice non-harming through control of thought, speech, and action. She's very good about this in uh, the Sanatana Dharma textbook. And this idea of thought, speech, and action comes from the Bhagavad Gita, the laws of Manu, and, and it has quite an old history, so to speak, in Hinduism. We determine the duties that we have to elders, equals, and youngers. This is something really new in Annie Besant's writings that I especially want to dwell on. We learn how to replace vice, which is understood as hate, with virtue, which is understood as love. And these are, again, raga and devesha in different guises. And we ascend the ladder of oneness, which I'll display to you in a moment on another slide. By the way, I noticed that you're taking notes and so on. It's a habit of mine to make a PDF of these slides available. And um, what I'll do is make sure that Damon has a copy of them. And those of you who are interested in having your own personal copy could perhaps get them from him. Is that OK, Damon? Perfect. OK, so in training the bodies, what do we do? With the physical body, it's restraint of the senses. We need to learn how to replace outward seeking with inward seeking. In other words, we don't look for happiness outside of ourselves. We look for an opening of bliss within ourselves. At the emotional level, we learn a restraint of the desires. And what this means is exchanging the pursuit of pleasure for the following or the allowing of bliss. At the mental level, we need to learn restraint of thought. And that means, in particular, transcending this idea of attraction repulsion. It's very difficult for us to realize how everything we think is a reaction of some kind, good or bad, and usually not very often indifferent. So one of the things we have to do is transcend that. Our personalities are built on the basis of our reactions. We know this through taste, but we also know it through the way the media are constantly manipulating us to get angry or upset and to keep clicking through on the news and so on by exposing us to you know, conspiracy theories and right-wing this and left-wing that and so on. So eventually, we have to learn to transcend that whole dynamic. We allow ourselves to get caught in the mental body when we're completely caught up in attraction repulsion, likes and dislikes. <clears throat> and then we need to open to the development of the intuitional or buddhic body. And we do this through the practice of brotherhood. In my belief, the reason that the first object, the practice of brotherhood, 
is the only one that's binding on all theosophists, is that it allows us to develop buddhi even when we're not thinking about it. Of course, if we sit down and ask ourselves, how do we develop buddhi or we decide we're going to develop buddhi, how far do you think we'll get? But if we simply show up in the world practicing brotherhood, we're working our way into that bliss of unity consciousness. And eventually it moves from a practice of brotherhood into a direct experience. So then, how do we practice non-harming? What we need is thought, speech, and action that is... Oh, I should, before I go on, this came, this, the idea for this slide came to me from something called either the three gates of speech or the four gates of speech. And on the internet, it's called an ancient Sufi teaching, except you'll never find it in a Sufi book. It actually had its basis in Victorian times, um, and it was called the, the three something or others. I don't think it was Bridges. But then a fourth one got added, and it got tacked on to Sufism. Um, and I think it's valid as a way of thinking. It's just that the history of it is uh, uh, convoluted. So we need thought, speech, and action that is, first of all, right and true. And when I say right, I don't mean righteous in the negative connotation of the word. Right as an expression of oneness. It also needs to be fitting or necessary. And I call this for moving stuckness into flow. I think we do a lot of harm in the world by thinking of things as problems and then encouraging people to apply our solutions, right? So the problem with thinking about problems and solutions is we don't know everybody's circumstances or conditions. And there may be many forces in operation that we're not aware of and that we demonstrate our ignorance of when we try to invent a solution to a problem. But what I've learned is, if you look at where someone is and you see that as suffering, and it may be a way that the life force is trying to flow, but it's getting stuck somewhere, if there's anything that you can do through thought, speech, or action that can gently move that stuckness into flow, you're practicing non-harming whereas a solution is usually harmful. The next one is, is it useful and beneficial? In other words, does it work for the greater good? And is it tolerant and kind to both self and others? So, in our ethics, if we're going to really practice non-harming and control thought, speech, and action, these, in my opinion, are the four things that we need to focus on. Now, this part about determining duties, it's tricky. Um, I'll define duties in a moment. But we have to think about a number of things. We have to think about age. We have to think about maturity, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. We have to think about position, someone's socioeconomic, political, religious, or cultural position. And we have to think about character and evolution. And we have to think about this in terms of ourselves and in terms of the people around us. Because in effect, we've got, with respect to age, youngers, peers, and elders. And what are our duties with respect to these three levels? With respect to maturity, we've got immature individuals, mature individuals, wise individuals. What do we do with them? With respect to position, we have inferiors, equals, superiors. And with respect to character or evolution, we have, according to a couple of different theosophical frameworks, undeveloped individuals, average individuals, and developed individuals. And these are correlated um, in the Sanatana Dharma with Thomas, Rajas, and Sattva, the three gunas, uh, inertia slash resistance with Thomas, activity slash restlessness with rajas, harmony slash peace with sattva. I put that one last because ideally, if we're going to have a superior, for example, in position, that superior will be full of harmony and peace. How often does that happen? So we have to recognize that if we're going to apply ourselves according to duties, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> 
we need to pay attention to a lot of different elements in deciding our relationship to other people. So here's what Annie Besant had to say about duties and rights. The birth of the human being into an organized society gives to him a claim and to society a duty, the claim of a child on its parents, the duty of the parents to the child. It is natural and proper claim of the younger on the older that has been perverted into the aggressive doctrine of rights. Animals, children, the sick, the ignorant, the helpless, all these have rights. The right to be kindly used, protected, nursed, taught, shielded. The strong, the grown-up, have only duties. <coughs> this comes from her monograph, Theosophy, from 1912. You can see why I fell in love with Annie Besson. You, you can't make a stronger claim, I think, that's just as valid now as before for ethics and morality. But the problem in our world culture, basically, is instead of the elders having duties and the youngers having rights, it's been switched. The, the ones on top claim that they have the rights to the duties of our service underneath them. So what do we mean by elders? Parents, grandparents, chronological seniors, teachers, mentors, employers, managers, bosses, governmental, religious authorities, evolutionary seniors, in other words, older souls, you might say, and God, or however we want to consider a supreme being. So, in a sense, all of these are worthy of our reverence, but then it gets tricky because not all of our teachers are going to be advanced souls. Same with uh, governmental authorities or religious authorities. But we still may need to have some kind of respect towards them in terms of duty, or we're not going to be able to make our way. And how do we have just the right amount of respect and also get rid of them if we need to get rid of them, vote them out of office, and so on? <coughs> so here's Bhagavan Das's special contribution. What he did was he went through uh, the ideas of attraction and repulsion, and he then fed them through this system of elders, equals, and youngers, and he came up with three levels of what could be considered our proper conduct towards these. And it's a quite amazing way of thinking, um, not intended to be memorized, but just a kind of guideline. Who are you with? How are, how are you feeling with respect to where they are on their evolutionary path, and then what you can do in order to relate to them properly. So under attraction and devotion, if the inequality is perceived as low, what you do is respect and esteem. In other words, the person who's elder is not too much elder than you. You offer them respect and esteem. If the inequality is moderate, in other words, they're definitely older than you are in terms of however you're describing advanced or elder behavior, you can offer them reverence. And if there's a great deal of inequality, you might end up offering them worship, which could be a bad thing. Um, people fall into these tendencies quite naturally. If on the other side, uh, the dislike side, you've got repulsion what happens is intimidation. The inequality perceived as low creates fear, apprehension. If it's moderate, you get dread. If it's high, you get terror. And certainly we can think of all kinds of authorities of different levels in which we will experience at various times in our lives any of these three levels. So what about equals? Siblings or cousins would be involved, chronological peers, co-workers, colleagues or team members, friends certainly, a spouse, a partner, and evolutionary peers, the individuals who share your beliefs and values and who are operating at a level that you consider to be especially close in terms of comradeship. And towards equals, how do we behave? If there's attraction, what we have is mutuality. If there's repulsion, 
we have hostility. If mutuality is perceived as low, we're simply polite. If it's moderate, we develop a friendship. If it's high, genuine love will develop. With hostility, if it's perceived as low, we simply get rudeness. If it's moderate, we get enmity. If it's high, we get hatred. You can see the brilliance of this system. It's so, it's so simple and so clear. And then if we're dealing with youngers, uh, we have children, grandchildren, chronological juniors, people behind us in terms of generations. If we have the infirm, handicapped, disadvantaged, students or trainees, employees, subordinates, constituents, congregants, if we're dealing with uh, political and religious authorities, and evolutionary juniors, those who are behind us in terms of younger souls. And then if we feel an attraction, the result is benevolence. If we feel repulsion, the result is condescension. If there's not much inequality, we'll offer kindness. If there is more inequality, in other words, the younger is much, much younger, tenderness may develop. And if it's very high, if there's an extreme level of inequality, we'll experience pity or compassion. And then as far as condescension, I don't need to go through this with a great deal of um, detail. If the inequality is perceived as low, we get self-importance. If moderate, contempt. And if high, disdain. And uh, I think in any class conscious society, we will have recognized that this pretty much covers the entire geography, so to speak. Okay, now I'm continuing on theosophical ethics. This is a, a slide on what it means to deal with uh, virtues. And Annie Besant was always teaching that we meditate on the opposite virtue. So what does that mean? This is just a very simplified version. The problem is separateness spreads. Hate in thought becomes, hate in speech becomes hate in action. Boy, have we been seeing this in the United States the last couple of years. And unity also could spread. Love in thought becomes, love in speech becomes, love in action. So the idea is, if we see separateness in ourself, if we see it all around us in the world, what we need to do is meditate on the opposite virtue. How can we develop unity within ourselves? How can we inspire it in the people around us? And this eventually leads to the last part of Theosophical Ethics in that earlier slide. We need to climb the ladder of oneness. And this comes directly from the Sanatana Dharma textbook. We start with family, that's our uh, laboratory, so to speak, with learning oneness. We build a community defined as local, social, occupational, religious, or spiritual. All of these can become differing laboratories for meeting elders, equals, and youngers and learning how to relate to them. Then, of course, nation, humanity. We have to learn to develop unity consciousness according to our first object race, creed, sex, caste, color, gender, sexuality. And then expand that even to the physical inhabitants of the planet, mineral, vegetable, animal. And Theosophy believes that all of these are conscious beings. So of course, if we're mining minerals and elements, we're taking them out of their evolutionary cycle. We're doing some harm, you could say. And then we have the non-physical inhabitants of the various planes that includes nature spirits, angels, devas, deceased humans, and so on. So Annie Besant was quite um, advanced in her thinking and her inclusiveness. And you might remember that one of the things I talked about with respect to a good ethical system is that it is as consciously inclusive as possible. I don't think she left anybody out. If somebody can think of something, let me know. So how do we apply this? And what I'm going to do here is something of my own development. I believe that the three objects of the Theosophical Society are a kind of spiritual practice in miniature. And what I want to do, uh, without going into detail about that, is to show how we can develop a sense of Theosophical ethics on the basis of looking at any problem through the lenses of 
these three objects. And I'll remind you of the objects just in case there are any newcomers to theosophy here. So I've done this as a workshop, uh, but you can do it in your own private meditations too. You start with a personal or a global challenge. Um, in one case, when I did a workshop, it was based on the Western medical system and how it operates. So, I mean, anything as big as that can be uh, looked at in this way. So, we look at it from the standpoint of practice, which is our first object. How do we approach it as a problem of a pro applied brotherhood? Second, we go into study, which is our second object, comparative study of science, religion, and philosophy. And we can consult historical, cultural, religious, philosophical, and scientific sources for ideas. And then there's an experiential component also, the third object having to do with the powers latent in humanity. We can meditate on higher perspectives, we can look for higher guidance, we can develop as far as we can an idea of what universal compassion would do, we can connect ourselves, so to speak, with our, at least our imagining of what the consciousness of the masters would be. Something like those books that came out years ago, What Would Jesus Do or What Would the Buddha Do? Uh, the Buddha Goes to Work and things like that. So with practice of the first object, here's what we can do in somewhat more detail. Here are some questions. How might brotherhood be enhanced by meeting this challenge? We could develop compassion and empathy. We could develop nonviolent or non-harming communication along the lines I was talking about earlier. We can think about how we might cooperate with the physical beings who are involved in whatever this challenge is. And why not? Cooperation with the non-physical beings involved as well. What we want to do is work for the greater good of all in order to develop unity consciousness. So when we bring in the second object, study, how do we approach that? The question is, what teachings are available about this challenge to help identify aspects, steps, lessons, solutions? We can go to our sources, the Mahatma letters, Blavatsky, W.Q. Judge, Annie Besant, C.W. Leadbeater. We can look to world scriptures. We can look to what I'm calling illuminated science, you know, the Gaia hypothesis, morphic fields, Rupert Sheldrake, and so on. We can look to the philosophies of ancient and modern seekers and teachers. And especially we need to look for conflicting viewpoints. Annie Besant was very strong on this. She said that you can't have a debate unless you really know what's going on with the other side. And as much as we dislike looking into beliefs and values that don't appeal to us or ethics, we have nothing to say. There's no constructive debate unless we know them from the inside. And then how do we deal with the experiential aspect, the third object? Here's our question. How might this challenge be met with experiential knowledge derived from higher states, realms, bodies, and beings? So you know, the problem with most people when they think about the third object, either because it attracts them or because they're maybe a little afraid of it, is they always think of it in terms of developing spiritual powers and never in terms of uh, solving problems, you know. And I think it's important to emphasize that if we practice the three objects as a spiritual practice, this experiential component is modified by our study and also by the idea of brotherhood. And if what we're doing is opening ourselves, not seeking, but opening ourselves to the kind of guidance that might lift us up above the stuckness that we're experiencing, the third object, in a sense, is rehabilitated. So we might meditate, we might look to our dreams, astral projection if it's available to us, that's something that I've experienced for decades. I can talk about that during the question answer. Inner guidance, and oops, I'm going to go back to that slide for a moment. Inner guidance, let me emphasize that. And uh, this is a tricky one within the history of the Theosophical Society because people's inner guidance sometimes tends to conflict. And everybody would like to believe that in the unity that comes with uh, brotherhood, that all inner guidance would be mutually supportive. That's not always the case. Um, 
you'll find that stress develops in many spiritual organizations over this idea. My bet is that if unity consciousness is really developed as an experience, there will tend to be more agreement than uh, conflict. But we also have in the Theosophical Society an impression, I'll call it an impression, that the idea of inner guidance is somehow threatening or a problem. And in fact, Blavatsky actually encouraged it, although this is not a very well-known quotation. I think it needs to be better known. Subjective, purely spiritual, quote-unquote, mediumship is the only harmless kind and is often an elevating gift that might be cultivated by everyone. Now, it's important to understand how carefully these words were uh, composed. Subjective means looking inward. We're not doing mediumship to conjure up a spirit. We're looking inward. We're raising ourselves up to a higher plane where it might be possible to meet some teacher. It's purely spiritual. That's what it means going up to a higher plane. She puts mediumship in quotes because it's not about trance. It's not about rolling your head around like you see in the movies and, and saying strange things with horrible faces. It's not about beings coming through you and not knowing necessarily what the be beings are. It's being a medium between our ordinary waking consciousness and some higher level of being. That's why she calls it an elevating gift. And she emphasizes that anyone can do it. And I think we're encouraged to do it by unity consciousness. It, it happens quite naturally, I believe. Uh, we get the tools that we need to promote unity consciousness by experiencing it. And that's what I think is referred to here as inner guidance by HPB. So what does this boil down to? Coming to my concluding slides here. What is theosophical morality? Recognize the unity of the self. Establish mutually helpful relations between all separated selves. Practice universal love as an expression of unity, the root of all virtues. These words are slightly paraphrased from Annie Besant from the Sanatana Dharma textbook. Recognize love's opposite, hate, as the root of all vices. And think about that in terms of self-hate as well as hate of others. There are many, many ways in which we abuse ourselves that we don't necessarily think of as hate, but would be considered a vice. And yet, probably the basis is some kind of hating of life, or hating of one's own life, or hating of oneself. And make the effort to transform vices into virtues. So here we have Annie Besant talking about universal brotherhood or unity consciousness. <coughs> People are divided by their bodies, both dense and subtle. I substituted a Sanskrit word, upadis. But they are all rooted in the one self. This teaching can put an end to wars and serve as a foundation for peace. Eradicating national hatreds, ending mutual contempt and suspicion, drawing all people into one human family. Again, from the advanced textbook. But then we have Annie Besson on what I'll call the ultimate morality. And this is a direct quote. The consciousness of the master stretches itself out in any direction in which he sends it, assimilates itself with any point to which he directs it, knows anything which he wills to know. In other words, this is booty. This is unity consciousness in its highest development. And all this in order that he may help perfectly, that there may be nothing that he cannot feel, nothing that he cannot foster, nothing that he cannot strengthen, nothing that he cannot aid in its evolution. So here we have working for the greater good of all and all-inclusive. To him, the whole world is one vast evolving whole and his place in it is that of a helper of evolution. He is able to identify himself with any step and at that step to give the aid 
that is needed. Now, it's in particularly with respect to that last statement that I went into the duties with respect to the elders, the equals, and the youngers. That is a guide for us to learn how to address ourselves in speech, thought, and action to anyone in a way that's non-harming along the lines of the ethics that I've been talking about today. And some of you will remember or have seen or pictures or actually been in the presence of this lovely stained glass window in the Leeds Lodge based on Reginald Mackle's The Path. And I included it here because you can see how the body, so to speak, of the master whose head is at the top and whose feet is at the bottom incorporates the whole of the evolutionary process. That's the ultimate morality, the end of theosophical ethics. Thank you.